Joyce Hawks is a biophysicist, biologist. Uh, she had a distinguished career with the National Institutes of Health, the uh, NOAA. <laughs> she, she's a marvel. In the late 70s, uh, she was home alone and something fell on her head and sent her to heaven. And she came back with a gift for healing. And she's been doing healing work ever since, including on me and a whole bunch of other people. And so she's a, she's a remarkable human being. She's one of the most compassionate people that I know and, uh, and the kindest and the most responsible. <laughs> we finally got her off the condo board. <laughs> so it's my pleasure to introduce to you a scientist and a healer, somebody who works with one foot into each world, Joyce Hawks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. It's so nice to see you all. It's a very interesting time about differences, and I'm going to show you a slide set, um, which will explain more of it. But when I was invited to speak here, what dropped in for me was how many differences there have been in my life. And that desire to find one thing that's our purpose. And my experience has been our purpose is a weaving of many aspects. So I want to encourage you in your own life to see the weaving and not be struggling for what is my purpose here. So let's go for it. Um, differences in our own lives first, and then we'll expand it to other differences. So now I'm going to put the slides on. Okay, can you all see it? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, goody. All right, so here we are today. Whee. So here's Seattle, Washington, where I've lived for mm, almost four decades. I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and the beginning of the pandemic, Helen and I decided to move up here, you can see on the right, we are at Glacier, Washington. We are on Highway 542, about almost 40 miles due east from Bellingham. And yesterday morning, we got up really early and drove to the end of the road. That highway ends on Mount Baker, or if you want to use the native word, Mount uh, Kulshan, and on your other side, and I'll show you some more pictures of that. But I also want to honor this land. This is Nooksack land originally. We were on the Nooksack Reserve yesterday and speaking to some people there. My great grandma uh, came from Tennessee. She was Native American. I feel her here. And when I first walked into this cabin before I bought it 25 years ago, I had no desire to live any place except Seattle and then fly around the world and go places. There was a vortex of energy that I could feel in the middle of the living room. And I went, wow, this is strange. I've never felt that anywhere. And um, the real estate guy who was selling it said, I said, no, I don't know about this. You know, he said, don't pass it by. It was a really good price in an excellent location. And I can't tell you how grateful I am to be here. And my backyard is actually, our backyard is actually the National Forest. So off we go here with our differences. So these pictures I took yesterday. Uh, this is Mount Baker. I don't know if you can see my arrow, but you can see the top of the mountain is still full of snow. The glaciers are working. And to the right is a picture that was down into the valley below us. Um, the location at a place called Artist Point, the end of the road, which is only open at the most seven, eight weeks a year because it's covered by snow. It's so high. It's oh, above 5,000 uh, feet. So the sense of difference of living in the city and being in the city 
versus being up here in the wilderness is amazing. And it's more in having lived here almost six months now with some few trips back to Seattle of the feet on the earth and the feet on native land, which I deeply appreciate. Um, people from the Lummi tribe have come up and spent some time here at the cabin with me and um, doing a, a ceremony at the river, the Nooksack River running off the glacier on the mountain runs just down the hill. And so that sense of appreciation for the land, for the wisdom of the land, for the wisdom of our native people, that in many senses we've lost. I want to bring that as one of the wonderful blessings of any time any of us have our feet on the earth. So what is my purpose in life? Is there just one pathway? How do I find it? Do I need a machete to cut the branches down? Where do I go? Or are there many paths? And I'm standing here and there's a little one to the right and there's another, oh my goodness, where do I go? What do I do? <clears throat> We've been somewhat programmed to think that we have one purpose in our life. I want to show you a quick story of my life and the awareness that has come when I ask this question for myself. What could possibly be my purpose with all these different things, how it's unfolded? So I grew up in a family. My mama was a nurse. She taught me how to sew, how to bake, <laughs> how to cook, how to walk in the world, bless her heart. My daddy was a mechanic and let me play with wrenches and uh, kind of foot in both worlds there again. Uh, nobody in my family had ever been to college. My daddy had grew up in the wilderness in Idaho. But a teacher in high school said, hey, you know, if you work a little harder, you'd do okay. So all of a sudden, I was in honors classes and then had opportunity to go to college. So I loved biology. There was something about learning about the organisms and how they were and all of that that just grabbed me. So I finished my college degree. Um, Lewis and Clark is near Portland, Oregon, where I grew up. And then I taught high school for a couple of years, taught high school biology, and uh, enjoyed it a whole lot. And then all of a sudden, guidance was go to graduate school. And I wound up in North Carolina at Wake Forest University. And I spent one summer at a research station clear up on the Blue Ridge Mountains, which was an amazing place. We were sampling water and looking at the little creatures that lived there and learning. You had to be careful because there were actually rattlesnakes close by and you couldn't just sit on a rock because you just might get um, and uh, that uh, research station, the uh, person who cooked for us loved grits, and I just never could get into grits. Oh. But the homemade biscuits and gravy were really good. So then after uh, finishing my master's degree at Wake Forest, I very much wanted to go in the Peace Corps. This was in the late 60s, and it was just like, ah, really want to go to the Peace Corps. And the professor at Wake Forest said, you know, you need to keep going and, uh, and do some more graduate work. So I actually listened to him, and I got a scholarship to go to Penn State University to study bio, well, to study zoology first. And then what happened was... I fell in love with an electron microscope, and that's me sitting in front of one of these one-ton pieces of equipment that looks inside of cells. I was just like, wow. But here's where differences come in. The faculty in the zoology department and the faculty in the biophysics department, for some reason, hated each other and fought all the time. And so if I wanted to do a research project that involved looking at the depths inside of cells and using this tool, I had to change departments. I was a really good biologist. And to go into biophysics meant I had to take all kinds of math and physics and differential equations and 
I, I, I did it stretch my brain, but I passed it. And of course, as a teaching assistant, what they assigned me to teach, the most advanced math you could imagine. And that's when I learned it. Oh, dear me. But I love the work with the electron microscope and what it revealed in the differences and the similarities inside of cells that are within us. Here is the weaving. My dad told me once <laughs> that he thought being a secretary was a really good job for a woman. And dad, come on. And so I had these interesting changes and differences in my family and the education and going from Portland, Oregon to North Carolina in the 60s and getting hit with a lot of prejudice um, for people of other color and uh, actually had some shouting fights with people about that. Nothing physical. Anyway, and then to Pennsylvania and moving from uh, a zoology watching looking at little bugs and be and now doing advanced math and and looking in electron microscopes at the inner workings of cells and so one step led to the light illuminating the next step and there's a feeling inside when that next step calls us for me it's a nudge that moves forward or if i go oh well i'm thinking about this i'm going to figure this out i'm going to go do blah 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 then there's a nudge that pushes me back or the doors close and I just can't do it. So listening inside of yourself for where your next step of guidance is to weave beautiful pattern of your life and your consciousness. I want to support you in that. So then I went had a postdoctoral fellowship with the National Institutes of Health at a primate center uh, near Portland, Oregon. And when I walked in and met the head guy, um, the first thing I said to him was, thank you very much. I really appreciate being here. And I'm not touching a monkey. And he went, what? What are we going to do with you? You're at a primate center. And I said, well, my work is electron microscopy. That means you have to kill, fix, embed in plastic section and put the stuff in the microscope. Well, what it turned out is that my work was with high speed lasers, Q switched lasers that were brand new. We, we created our own in this huge room. Now they're used to remove tattoos <laughs> in the human world. But we we're working on the effects of pigment in fish and I got little fishies from Seattle, from National Marine Fisheries. They were interested in the work. And um, that research on the effects of high-speed lasers on pigment, as it was published, and I have many, many publications, won me the um, award, it's an elected award as a fellow in the American Association for Advancement of Science. Who knew? Goodness gracious. And then... I was hired after my postdoc uh, down there at the Primate Center uh, to head an electron microscopy lab, lab at National Marine Fisheries, which is right near the University of Washington. So I had a, an adjunct, adjunct faculty position in, at UW. And the work that I did there and the publications with that won a national award. So things were going really well. I had all kinds of people working for me who were doing all this stuff. And we, they gave me the money when I came there to buy brand new electron microscopes. Those babies are really pricey. And so we had, I also got to help build in the basement a whole bunch of rooms because we need um, a great stability. So we put down another cement <laughs> flooring over the top of what was there anyway. So we put in a transmission electron microscope that looks inside of cells, a scanning electron microscope that looks at the surface of cells, like the image that you see. 
there, this is the edge. I don't know if you can see my arrow, but here is one in the middle, single skin cell with scanning microscopy. That's the surface of the cell in a fish. In humans, skin cells look like a pile of dirty old papers, but fish have beautiful skin. So we have a wonderful lab, lots of people working, lots of publications, lots of travel and presenting at uh, scientific meetings all over the place. And then, things are going so well, um, and I was hit on the head with this leaded glass window. One of my books is over on the side, so you see how big this thing was. Very heavy. I purchased it on a trip to the Oregon coast at a little shop, and it was on the mantle in my house. I was uh, divorced and living alone at that point. And uh, this thing, for no reason at all, when I was near the mantle actually vacuuming, fell off, hit me on the head. And an hour and a half or two hours later, when I woke up from the coma, my head had a huge mat of dried blood. So with that kind of injury, you're usually dead forever. But I went on the other side. It was amazing. I mean, I saw my mother and grandmother both had passed, and they could greet me with their love. I didn't believe in any of that. I was then in a place of light, walking with beautiful sky and rolling hills and nobody around. and No questions, no anxiety, simply a being, uh, which wasn't my usual. My usual was, let me figure this out. Let's see what I do next. What's next? What's next? Blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, in the presence of a being of light, well, I still don't know if it was an angel, just an aspect of the divine presence, if it was Jesus or Muhammad or Bus's heart, or who knows. Maybe it was Shiva. I don't know. But in that presence, I was known completely. And there were, it was like, don't bother with secrets. Everything's known about you. And no sense of judgment there. It was a place of profound, profound blessing. And love, and the love of connection and oneness was so deep. I still get shivers all the way through my body just telling you about it and thinking about it. So, wow, what an experience. I came back from that, um, went to uh, work, that Monday, it was on a Friday night this happened, and one of my colleagues saw me and said, Joyce, you look like hell. I said, yeah, I got hit on the head. Did you see your doctor? Well, I don't have one. You know, I grew up in a family where on the prairie, you don't have any doctors. So anyway, he took me to his doctor, and they did a scan, and yeah, I had a little blood on the brain, but not too bad. But I had to stop and not work and not run the lab for six weeks. It was really a challenge to have to be with myself because at that point in time, I'd climbed Mount Hood, I'd climbed Mount Adams, I'd climbed St. Helens before she blew up. I was running three miles around Green Lake in Seattle at least once, sometimes twice every day in less than 20 minutes, really fit. And I could not even go out for a walk. It made my head hurt. I couldn't read because tipping my uh, head hurt and I loved music classical music and the bass was just too much so I had to put it with myself for six weeks it was astonishingly difficult <laughs> talk about differences who are you girl anyway then uh, I met a healer and uh, and a friend who was taking some classes and started just exploring different stuff. And uh, this was after the six weeks. And I found Ray Moody's book in a bookstore, Life After Life. So, oh my goodness, other people have had these weird, strange experiences. And then I went down to Mount Shasta with the healer that I was trying to learn some things from. And on the way back from Mount Shasta, which was a wild and woolly experience, I won't go into the details, but woo, Shasta is one of those places. Woohoo! Uh, and there were four of us there, and uh, it, it was wild. 
um, very wild. But on the way back, we stopped at a shrine in Portland, Oregon called the Grotto. And I came up and knelt right at that little stone uh, railing and was simply praying. I was there by myself. And a woman's voice said, you are called to heal. Well, <laughs> I didn't grow up Catholic. I was originally Presbyterian, and then I became an atheist. And uh, on hearing this voice, it was so utterly authentic, so profound. And I think it was the Mother Mary. And so I actually resigned my position at the lab the next business day. And it took me a couple months to finish a manuscript and get people trained and get out of there. So the NDE was 1976. I changed careers in 1984. And talk about differences. My goodness, I figured, crud, I... I did all that research, I did all this work, I went to all that graduate school, and man, 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 if this is what I was supposed to do, that's weird. And I figured I would never speak to a crowd again, because I'd been asked by National Marine Fisheries and by National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to present to some very large groups on the research we were doing. I figured I'd just be in the basement of my house, seeing people one at a time, and that was fine, okay, goody, goody. But what has unfolded from that is even more connection with the world. I've spoken in England and a number of places across Canada, including Clear Over and Halifax and TV shows and the um, um, TEDx talk, which has a million point three hundred thousand views now. It's amazing how things have unfolded. So I got a calling, one of those callings of, uh, do it, to go to the Philippines. And by accident, <laughs> met this man, his name is Roberto Pidal, called Choi for short, his wife, Espy. This is my little daughter. Uh, we brought him and his wife back here uh, for a while and uh, took him up in the snow on Mount uh, Rainier. And this, a friend of mine just caught this picture. It's not been uh, phony at all. It was simply on our little digital camera. He reads the energy in his hands. And look at his face. He's in trance at this point. His, little, his hands on Annalise's back. And here from probably the seventh chakra, past the six, comes a beam of light through her. All of a sudden, I was experiencing amazing things. And I stayed there for four months. The little daughter was with me and um, uh, worked with him. Each of us have healing gifts. We're all healers. Our bodies are healing all the time. We can help each other with the energy of blessing, of prayer, of healing. And each of the major healers that I've studied with all worked differently. And part of it is, if you find a teacher, find one that will help you develop your gift, not try and replicate somebody else's, but what is your gift? How do you weave your gift? So those four months were amazing, and then he was here for a while. Uh, and then I had the opportunity to go to Bali. And that turned out to be 10 years of going back and forth between Seattle and Bali. And this is the healer that I met, the second one. And she said, you work with me only. She'd never taken a Western student. Jiro Sri Manku. <laughs> Bless your heart, she's passed on now. She was intense. You can see the intensity in her face. And she would take me to um, various temples. Some of them, like Basaki is the major mother temple in Bali, and everybody goes there. But then she would take me to temples that there was no sign for. She told the driver, you go here, you go there, you drive down this little road, and all of a sudden, here's some big, incredible carving. Look at this carving. This is the sea dragon. This is amazing. And there she is. Um, making offerings to the spirits of the temple. What she would do is trance dance around me and uh, 
and chant, and then she'd slug the heck out of me. <laughs> it was like, okay, I'd never heard of anything like that. And what happened after the slugging is that I could see things and read things in the universe that I never had any idea of whatsoever. And so it opened the skills to understand the depth of what's going on inside someone's body, the depth of the blessing of the universe. And when I would come back from these trips, I was, had my little office and I was seeing individual clients. I could work with, assist people with their healing journey far better than before I went. And it was another one of these what a different culture. What a different way of doing anything. It's not like figuring it out. You get slugged, for heaven's sakes. And I, by the way, don't slug any of my students. Or I haven't started that yet, you guys. <laughs> so I was sitting in Bali in the hot sand at one of the temples and crabbing inside my brain, which I mentioned earlier about having to do all that science and years of classes and papers and all that stuff if what I was supposed to do if my calling was doing spiritual work. And what came to me was, we invite you to put science and spirit together. I went, oh, okay. So all of a sudden, it made sense. So the differences in the pattern of learning and work in my life, all of a sudden started weaving together. And it was a step back into in another culture, the whole nine yards of, whoa, what does it mean when I can put together all of the background and the guidance that has been in my life? Weaving, weaving, weaving. Take a moment, please, each of you. Just stop and think of the weaving that's brought you to where you are now. How many different threads in your life have taught you. And you don't have to chop them off and cut them out. Allow them to weave together with appreciation, with joyousness. Okay, so I've um, been doing this, what I call cell level healing since 1984 till now. I'm 80 years old. You'd think I'd retire, but I haven't. It's not been guided. Um, I'm booked out till next April. And here are some differences in the body. And I'll show you pictures that I took with the electron microscope. So in a human body, there's 200 different kinds of cells. Everyone has a different structure. And everyone divides and repairs itself or uh, lives a certain amount of time. There are cells in your intestines, in your gut, that divide every single day. There are cells in your heart that have been there since you were born. There are cells that divide once a month in certain parts of you. Cells that divide once every couple of years. Everyone has a different enzymatic, physiological pattern as well as shape. They're not all little round jobbies. So the picture you're seeing here is a section across some muscle and the light um, whitish sort of droplet is a drop of fat that's feeding it. And here are these little dark things on either side. Those are mitochondria, which are producing the energy for that muscle to work. And depending on how tall you are, how big you are, you have between 75 and 100 trillion cells in your whole body. You have a billion cells in your brain. I mean, come on, we are amazing. The body is the most incredible creation. This is what muscle looks like. Um, you see 
little fibers and then there's some little holes above and below there's each band of muscle and that's where the blood and the fluids come and go to feed the muscle just enjoy the appearance of how beautiful it is seen with an electron microscope and this by the way is muscle from a fish and it looks exactly like the muscle in you i'm going to show you some amazing similarities and differences and okay on the one side on my left anyway is a little bump that's in the intestine with little tiny fingers that come out that absorb nutrients and on the right is one of my favorite all-time cells it's called a macrophage macro large faga eater and it's actually eating scar tissue and inside you see vesicles where it's digesting the scar tissue and then making those amino acids and other components available to the body. And so this, it used to be believed that there were a few macrophages floating in our bloodstream. And if there was an injury in our body, then they would divide and get busy and go do their work. But recently it's been published within the last, I don't know, four years or so in the journal Science that they found macrophages are kind of like an amoeba almost, but they're lying underneath our skin, just hanging there, waiting until they're needed. And so they respond very quickly to help clean up an injury. And they're amazing. They'll clean up bacteria and viruses also, but any other kind of injury. They're an important part of our body. So on the left is one single cell. This one kind of looks like it's going, whoa, are you looking at me? And on the left part of the cell is a, just a part of the nucleus, which has the um, DNA and information. Our genes are there. So many of them in every single cell. If you strung it out, it goes around the earth, I think one and a half times. I, and what's inside of all this stuff in that tiny, tiny, level is amazing. And then the what looks like its other eye that's kind of a little black stuff, that's an area where um, junk <laughs> is gathered in a cell and then digested, like in the macrophage, so that whatever is no longer needed or useful gets reused. Now, the mitochondria, which are the source of all our energy, are these little teeny tiny dark things all over the place, scattered around the cell. And on the right is a very high magnified view, not mine. It's also been colored just to make it cute. But there's all kinds of stories about mitochondria. Um, I'm not going to go into all of that. But this is where the enzyme sits, just under that outer membrane of the mitochondria that simply produces all the energy that keeps you warm, that keeps you alive, that keeps you talking, that keeps you looking, keeps you walking. They are amazing. And so here's an example of something you can do. If you feel exhausted, I'm just so tired. You just invite and uh, the blessing of the divine source, however that is closest to you, to flow through your body and touch the mitochondria, they actually have their own DNA and they divide. When a cell divides, the mitochondria divide on their own. They're amazing. And when I, I'm tired and I do that, all of a sudden energy comes back. So here's a very simple little combination of science and spirit. Invite the spiritual truth that's yours, the source of the universe to flow through your body, touching the science of the mitochondria to allow more energy to support you. Works. I'm watching the time, you guys. Okay. Now, differences at a cellular level. This guy is going, what, what, what are, what are the differences? Come on. Uh, what are they? Listen, folks. Half of your DNA is shared with a banana. How different are you? Half 
I, I said this once at a talk and somebody came up afterwards and said, I can't ever eat a banana again. Oh dear. All right, it gets worse than that. Look at this. Here's a firefly or fruit fly, I'm sorry. You share 61% of your DNA with that little fly. You share 85% of your DNA with a mouse. Now get ready for this one. You share 98% of your DNA with a chimpanzee or an ape. And that 2% that's left is enough to make you a human. Oh my goodness. Are we all one, dear hearts? All living things share information, biochemistry, physiology. And as humans, we are all one also. So I want you to take a moment to honor the weaving of your life. I hope you have a deeper view of oneness at this point. And connection, honor your connection with each other. We are one with body, mind, and spirit. And as we honor each other, we serve in however our calling is today. Now, the next step into the light may bring the next. And what is the bottom line of our journey then? It's love. And Helen is now going to sing a song of love to complete the talk. Thank you. Joyce, will you stop your share, please? I'll be singing uh, some songs by Gina Salah, who lives in Seattle. And if you don't know Gina, you should look her up. She's a beautiful uh, expression of the divine in every way. Because the one I love lives inside of you. I lean as close to you as I can Because the one I love lives inside of you I lean as close to you as I can Because the one I love lives inside of you I lean as close to you as I can. I love you, 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 I love you just as you are. I love you, 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 I love you just as you are. Because the one I love lives inside of you. I lean as close to you as I can. Cause you can lay back in the arms of love Lay back in the arms of love Rest back in the arms 
you are safe from harm. Rest back in the arms of love. I let love pour over me. I let, I let love flow. I let love pour over me. I let, I let love flow. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, we have a little time for a group sharing. Um, if anybody has anything uh, that's rising up in your heart that you would like to share in response to um, what we've heard today or, uh, or just in general. I, actually, I, I'd like to ask Joyce a question. Um, what are mitochondria? You said they have, they have their own DNA, and I've heard this before, but I've never understood, like, are they, are they human? Are they part of us? What's the relationship? Are we just, like, you know, totally symbiotic? Or I, I... Okay, so here you have one single cell, and it has a thousand mitochondria inside of it. They're little tiny parts inside of the cell. And every cell in your body, all 100 trillion of them, are full of mitochondria. And they're in there doing their work to give you the energy to make enzymes, to breathe, to do all this stuff. Um, and the strange thing about them is, as you mentioned, uh, Michael, is that they have a little strand of their own mitochondria. Uh, and they're all from your mother. Because the sperm of your father simply injects DNA, the genetic stuff, into the egg cell, but it doesn't inject any mitochondria. So all of us have mitochondria for mama. <laughs> and they are itsy weetsy tiny parts seen only with the electron microscope inside of each and every cell. And every cell in the body has them. So... Uh, the theory about that they might be alien or some other part that went inside of the early cells in the mud puddles before we got to be, you know, whole beings, uh, was because they carry their own DNA. So <laughs> uh, they are an amazing part of our body. They truly are. I hope that helps, Michael. Yeah, the, the, uh, that was even better than I'd hoped for. The, uh, <laughs> knowing, knowing and they're in all animals. other animals, not just us.